To all the drivers out there delivering holiday cheer across our great country, season's greetings and a huge thank you from the Allen Lund Company. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Scott Thompson. Wreaths across America, the annual tradition of placing wreaths on the graves of the fallen, continues this weekend, and a senior OIDA member will be participating for the first time, hauling wreaths to the grave sites of those who made the ultimate sacrifice. Lamar Buckwalter explains why it was an opportunity he just couldn't pass up. Then we'll spend some time talking about the DOT's fall 2023 regulatory agenda. It's out, giving us new insight into the department's plans moving forward. We'll do a deep dive on what's in store for 24, from possible mandates of speed limiters and automatic emergency braking systems to unique electronic identifiers, broker transparency, and much, much more. In fact, some of those very issues came up this week during a hearing within the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee, and GOP members pulled no punches when it came to their thoughts. We'll cover that, too, with Jay Grimes of OIDA's Washington, D.C. office and Jamie Jones, managing editor of Landline Magazine. So lots to get to over the next hour. But first, the news with Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Scott. The proposal that would mandate speed limiters was a topic of discussion during a House subcommittee hearing. Representative Troy Nels of Texas urged FMCSA to listen to truck drivers when considering regulations. I'm going to trust you on this, but I just hope that that you equally consider the 15,000 comments, 15,000 comments from America's truckers who have provided input on this rulemaking. Uh, They're not going to be able to host a big fundraiser for you. Representative Nels held up the October issue of Landline magazine, urging Administrator Hutchinson to give it a read. Are you familiar with Landline magazine? You familiar with this? Representative, I am. It's very good magazine. Do you read it or do you just get it or it sits on your desk or do you read this? This Uh, is the October 2023 issue, page 12. Very dangerous, very dangerous. It says here talking about the, uh, the, uh, the speed limiters on this thing. Uh, read this article because I tell you, the people that travel around, and I think you mentioned earlier that, that truckers are moving a lot of our goods and service around. Listen to the truckers. I think they would know better than the bureaucrats and specifically Congress on this. Uh, the AEB rule, I'd like to pivot to that. I believe NHTSA, FMCSA has gone far beyond congressional intent to include vehicles for which AEB technology is not practical. Vocational, emergency vehicles, the rule uh, was written, is not implementable. I don't believe it is. Vocational vehicles are not completed on our factory lines. The chassis is sent to third-party uh, third customization shops where heavy equipment is added, like a dump truck with a big stove plow in front of it. Manufacturers would not be able to certify the system once the vehicle is altered, which can lead to a misleading understanding of AEB for the operator. Hutchison declined to answer specific questions about the speed limiter rulemaking until a formal proposal is released. The notice of proposed rulemaking, which could be unveiled as early as this month, is expected to include a top speed at that time. Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg spoke about truck parking and the supply chain with Wyoming Public Media recently. The station reports that in an interview, Buttigieg was asked about a $26 million investment that would go toward two semi-truck parking areas along I-80. You know, I think in the last couple of years, people have begun to really understand how personal and how important supply chains are. And one of the most important parts of our supply chains are uh, truckers, long-haul trucking. And, you know, having grown up about a mile from I-80 in a very different part of the country uh, in northern Indiana. I know how important those networks and those interstates are from coast to coast. Truck parking has been a quality of life issue and even a safety issue for truck drivers at a, at a moment when we're really trying to support truck drivers and encourage them to stay in the profession. The funding for these projects comes from around $600 million provided through President Biden's infrastructure package. 
$817 million has been announced to improve safety and prevent roadway deaths. The U.S. Department of Transportation announced the funding from President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure law for 385 safe streets and roads for all grants. The funding will go toward regional, local and tribal communities for implementation, planning and demonstration projects driven at the local level to improve safety and help prevent deaths and serious injuries on the nation's roadways. This announcement includes 40 48 implementation grants focused on safety projects and strategies and 337 grants for planning and demonstration activities. More details are emerging about Indiana's 10-year plan to implement more truck parking. 13 News reports that Indiana's Department of Transportation has a 10-year plan to add parking and improve close to two dozen rest areas and welcome centers across the state. The $600 million investment would add approximately 1,100 more truck parking spaces. Right now, it's estimated that there are around 1,400 spaces for trucks. Construction on these improvements are underway. A bill to improve pothole repair in New Jersey is one step closer. The Senate Transportation Committee voted unanimously to advance the bill that is intended to address concerns about pothole damages to roads and bridges throughout the state. New Jersey is ranked among the worst state in the country for potholes. The bill would help improve state road maintenance by requiring the New Jersey DOT to provide information about pothole repairs and pothole damage claims in its annual report to the legislature. The bill awaits further consideration on the Senate floor. The National Highway Traffic Safety Administration has taken the first step toward making impaired driving prevention technology standard in new passenger vehicles. NHTSA announced a notice of proposed rulemaking that would help fulfill a requirement in the bipartisan infrastructure law. This announcement comes as NHTSA kicks off its annual holiday season drive sober or get pulled over impaired driving campaign, which raises awareness of the dangers of driving while impaired by alcohol or drugs. A new rural autonomous vehicle research program has been announced by the U.S. Department of Transportation. Accredited universities are eligible to apply for this $25 million funding opportunity that would be a six-year cooperative agreement program. Recipients will use RAV program funding to conduct research regarding the benefits and responsible application of automated vehicles and associated mobility technologies in rural and tribal communities. One $15 million award will focus on passenger transportation, and a separate $10 million award will focus on movement of freight to support and enable automated freight and delivery vehicles serving rural areas. A port of entry that was updated and modernized has opened on eastbound Interstate 90 near Tilford. South Dakota Highway Patrol posted that the new facility uses electronic pre-screening of trucks and an indoor inspection bay to reduce downtime for drivers and get them back on the road faster. And finally, a unique find at a shelter donation bin in Oregon. UPI reports that a pair of gold Air Jordan 3 sneakers commissioned by Spike Lee was discovered. The shoes are valued at more than $10,000. The designer of the Air Jordan 3 sneakers paid a visit to the shelter and confirmed they were a custom pair. The shoes will soon be auctioned off and are expected to bring in a whopping $20,000. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Ashley Blackford. Thanks, Ashley. A reminder, if a carrier, shipper, receiver, or broker coerces you to violate any regulations, you don't have to sit and take it. In fact, you're encouraged to file a complaint with the National Consumer Complaint Database. You've got two ways to do that, either by calling 1-888-DOT-SAFT or by going online and doing it there. Coming up next, this weekend, a couple million volunteers and supporters will be out and about throughout the United States, placing wreaths on the gravestones of our nation's heroes. Wreaths Across America pays tribute each and every year to those who made the ultimate sacrifice for us. And one of this year's first-time volunteers is OIDA senior member Lamar Buckwalter. He joins us after the break to talk about what inspired him to get involved, what he's looking forward to most, and more. So stick around. We're back right after this. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. 
control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com. Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Welcome back. Raise Across America Day is this weekend. An OOIDA senior member will be participating. Lamar Buckwalter joins me now. Lamar, for those who aren't familiar, what is Raise Across America? Raise Across America actually puts wreaths at the tombstones of our vets all across the country. And how did you get involved with this? How did it come about that you would be participating? The lady that actually does all my print work was talking to me about it a little bit. And I'm like, well, I've heard all about it. I've obviously heard about it on the road, seen trucks, seen pictures, all that good stuff. And I'm like, you know what? How cool would it be to actually participate in it? So I followed up with her and I'm like, well, you're going to need a truck driver to haul your wreaths down here. And she's like, uh, yes, I am. So she pointed me in the right direction. Lo and behold, I got a load and I got a total of nine different cemeteries I'm going to be delivering to. Yeah, I was curious about that. Can you explain to me what what specifically you will be doing? So actually, I'm going to be loading up tomorrow here in Pennsylvania, taking a load up to Maine and deliver it on Sunday, lay over till Monday, reload a full trailer load of wreaths to bring back here to Pennsylvania to various different cemeteries. Uh, there's like, like I said, nine different cemeteries I'll be delivering to. Nine different coordinators and volunteers all over the place. Now, two of the sites are actually, I'll have PD, police department, and fire department escort, like a little parade type ceremony, just to kind of welcome the threes in and celebrate the, our veterans. Why did you want to do this? I, Me personally, I feel our vets don't get near the recognition they deserve. And I feel it's just something I can do to give back to them for what they've done for us. How, what does it, does something like doing something like this kind of get you in the holiday spirit? Uh, yes and no. If anything else, it actually it builds the morale. Mm-hmm. Gets, gets me excited knowing that I'm giving back to those that can't say anything for us. I mean, obviously, we're putting trees at tombstones, so obviously these vets have already given mm-hmm. their lives to us. So it gives me a, a good feeling, though, that I'm giving back to them since they already made the ultimate sacrifice for us. Have you ever um, participated in anything like this before? Not Reeves Across America. Um, here in my hometown, we always, every Mother's Day, we put a big truck convoy together for the Mother of the Make-A-Wish Foundation. Mm-hmm. And I participate in that. I sponsor that event. But this is this is something all new to me now. What do you typically haul? Uh, I take processed chicken to Texas and bring produce back from Texas to Pennsylvania. Oh, wow. So this is a, kind of a whole different... Oh, it's altogether different. I... I was actually thinking about it here this past week when I was trying to find a load going up to me. I'm like, man, it's been probably 15 years since I've been up to the Northeast. And now every time I call my customers and say, hey, I need a load going to Maine, they're thinking that something's dramatically wrong with me (laughs) because I don't typically run that area. (laughs) And then my one customer, when I told them what I was doing, they're like, oh, well, we'll help you out. Don't worry. We got you covered. Sure enough, they, they called yesterday and said, hey, we got a load for you to go to Maine. Wow. So it, it's, it was nice for me because obviously I'm donating all my time and my fuel to the cause. I'm not charging anything mm-hmm. for any, you know, obviously the load going up, I will, but I'm not charging anything coming home. So I'm eating up all that. Yeah, it was a real good feeling to know that a customer came through for me. That's awesome. Do you have any connections to the service? Are you a veteran or do you have related to any anybody who's served? Uh, I have two cousins that had served and then I have my firehouse family. I have quite a few guys at my firehouse that are veterans and the most the most near and dear to me is actually my trailer sales rep from utility utility keystone trailers sean rosick he's he's a veteran he he served in the marines and had i don't know how many different tours of duty he quickly became more than just a sales rep he was more he 
became more of a brother to me. And I'm like, you know what? Yeah, I really need to do something for him and his brothers and sisters. Talk to me about what does this mean to to be able to participate in this, to be able to do this, um, to haul these uh, wreaths, and then to be there to witness them being laid on on the graves. I think it's going to be a very somber feeling because if I understand the process correctly, as you walk up, you're supposed to walk up to the the tomb, address the fallen soldier by his or her name, and then take a moment and just kind of pause and reflect on what they did before placing the wreath and then place the wreath and step back again, kind of take a a moment of silence and reflect and and call their name out again, just like making sure that they are never forgotten. So I I think it's going to be a very somber, very, it's going to be full of emotion for sure. And I'll admit it, I'm a crier, so I'll probably be crying the whole time. But why is it so, how, why is this important that we do this? You know, especially this time of year when a lot of people are with their families. And of course, a lot of those who have served um, have paid the ultimate sacrifice. And, and why is that so important? I feel, I personally feel it's important because for the families left behind, they know their, their family member is not forgotten. And obviously over the holidays, it it hits everybody the hardest because their family member is not with them. And I think it's just, just a really unique way of remembering that fallen soldier or veteran and let the family know that, hey, we, you know, we do care about what, what your family member did do for us. Do you think this will be one of those halls that will stand out for you for years to come? Oh, I have no doubt in my mind that it will definitely stand out in my mind it, in more ways than one. You know, just the sure fact of giving back to the veterans plus the way I wrapped my trailer I'm sure it'll be definitely one to remember. Tell me more. You wrapped your trailer. Tell me what that looks like. So I am a diehard Snoopy fanatic. I, my entire life, Snoopy was always my hero, the, the cartoon character. Yeah. He, he kind of stood for the underdog and was always the one that, that saved the day. I, I just, I really appreciated that. So Reeves Across America offers different wraps, but in their wraps, they they wanted with my business name listed. I didn't feel comfortable with that because I'm like, okay, the day and the event's not about me or my business. It's about the veterans. So I freehand drew out six different Snoopies with six different uniforms representing each branch of the military and they're carrying the American flag off, wow. heading off to a cemetery. So if, if nothing else, everybody's going to remember the Snoopies on the side of my trailer. Wow. You drew them. I drew them, yes, yeah, because uh-huh. obviously copyright laws take effect, mm-hmm. yeah. and I didn't want to get in trouble with copyright. So to get past that, I freehand drew it out and made a what I can tell as a significant difference between the original Snoopy and the, the real and my Snoopy. Mm-hmm. Just to kind of, the average person won't be able to see it, but I as a Snoopy fanatic and anybody else as a Snoopy fanatic would be able to pick out that, oh yeah, that's not the real Snoopy. And how does that, you know, I mean, that's obviously going to catch the attention of, of people. Um, do you hope they they see that, maybe engage with you on, on some of your stops, even just uh, fueling up to see what you're doing and, and so you can talk about Reese Across America? That's the motive behind it, yes. I'm really hoping that people take a look at it and say, okay, what, what is this all about? And then I have, that, that opens the door for me to explain to them what exactly Reese Across America are and how they can potentially get involved in it. Now, you're a member of OOIDA. How long have you been a member? You're a senior member, I know. Yeah, that's a great question. Long <laughs> enough to have senior membership. Yes. So it's been I, a few years. It is, well, we'll just say a few minutes. How's that? A few minutes. All right. Time, yeah, a few minutes. Otherwise, it'll make you sound really, really old. <laughs> um, why is it so important to be a member uh, of OOIDA? I feel it's a mer- very, very important, the resources they have. You know, if you're ever... Any kind of questions of any sort in the industry, call on them, and they will pair you up to the proper individual. To, and they they always have our backs as the drivers. You know, they're with the the new regulation coming down the line of the speed limiters. They're going to bat for us drivers, saying, "Hey, this is not a great idea." We drivers know it's not a great idea. You no, know, I just got a big enough voice that they can represent us. So obviously, we as a membership have to back them. And I just feel it's good to have somebody by our side, helping us along the way and and has our best interests in mind. And this year also, you were named one of TA Citizens Driver Award honorees. Can you tell me more about that? Uh, Yes, actually, so funny story. The 
same lady that I'm doing the reads across America for, her and her daughter are the ones that nominated me for that award. And yes, I was awarded the TA Citizen Driver of the Year Award back in back in March at the Mid American Truck Show. And this past August, August 22nd, I had the truck stop dedicated to me. It's pretty. That was a pretty unique honor to to have the and for lack of a better term, bragging rights. Just kind of say, hey, look, you know. If I can do it, you can do it. And it's, you know, we truck drivers are, we're not the, the bad guys on the road like the media likes to make us happen. Mm. What are you looking forward to most with doing the hauling the reeds across America? Just being able to honor the vets and, and their families, giving back. Anybody that knows me and knows me personally knows that I'm a giver and helper. I, I, do, I do my best work when I'm helping. And like I actually, as we speak right now, I'm actually on a fire call again as we speak. Now it's a simple one; it's just monitoring a CO alarm. But I'm always giving back in some fashion, be it my kids' youth group, the, the public school, my fire department. I'm always looking for new ways to give back. My my wife gets mad at me because she's like, "Dear, you know, you really have a lot more money in your bank account if you quit giving it to everybody." But I'm a giver. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned you have kids. Or what do you hope this teaches them by you doing um, the Reads Across America? Well, both my kids, they're actually in super support of it. Unfortunately, I have to miss one of my daughter's orchestra concerts because of it. But for them, they understand and know that daddy's giving back to the vets. And they, they follow along with that trend that they understand that we're, we need to recognize those that gave it all to us. And I'm hoping that throughout it all, that it'll entice them to get their friends involved and their friends as parents involved and just keep the ball rolling with Rees Across America until we have a re that every tombstone of every vet. Can you talk to me a little bit about the connection between trucking and and the military and those who have served? Uh, that's a tough one. Wow. I would say, well, the vets, I mean, obviously... We wouldn't have our freedom if it wasn't for our vets, and we wouldn't have what we have on our backs and over our heads and in our bellies if it wasn't for a truck driver. So the two kind of go hand in hand. The vets provided the safety for us and continue to provide safety for us while the truck driver brings the needs to America, the free America. All right. So you're also a volunteer firefighter? I am a volunteer firefighter EMT here back home, yes, oh, wow. as well as a fire instructor. Oh, gosh. Wow. You do sound busy. Yeah, and on top of that, then when I'm home, I also help a friend of mine that does a, has a towing business. I help him do tow jobs from time to time. Wow. Live life like there's no tomorrow and live life to its full. That's good advice. Well, I, I've always strived to be a good role model for my peers as well as the younger generation. Mm-hmm. And every day I, I wake up knowing that it's a great day to be alive, and every day I wake up with a new adventure. That was Lamar Buckwalter talking about Reese Across America. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. Cut me off? What do you mean? It's only 1130. Oh. Oh. Hey, Mill, give me a beat. All right, here we go. Let's do this one more time. That sounds great. Yeah, that's a good one. Hey, sing along with me. Come on. Air brakes sigh on the freeway I wave and point and give folks leeway It's the Christmas Eve rush Before the Christmas Eve hush I'm pedaling hard to make my home 20 Only got a hundred miles or a thousand My wife and kids, they be all smiles We'll light up the tree, watch Grinch on TV I'm pedaling hard to make my home 20. In the morning we will open presents. I bet my wife's will be some more perfume. We saved up to get the children iPads. But all I really want is in this room. Soon enough, I'll be going bye-bye. Cause those bills, you know, I'll be owing. A week will go by, then homeward I'll fly, pedaling hard to make my home 20. We'll see you soon. All right, I've had enough. 
Today's rising costs affect everyone. Replace your harmonic damper with a genuine Vibratech TVD viscous damper to prevent costly repairs and downtime. Keep your money in your pocket and your truck on the road with Vibratech TVD. Recommended replacement at 500,000 miles or 15,000 hours. Ready to make more money? Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. Welcome back to Landline Now. As we approach the end of the year, we're getting a better sense of what's in store for 2024 from the people and agencies who make the policies and rules that impact you. The DOT's Fall 2023 Regulatory Agenda Report was released recently, and there's plenty to get to. So let's get into it with Jay Grimes of OIDA's Washington, D.C. office and Jamie Jones of Landline Magazine. Thanks to the both of you for being here. We appreciate it. Oh, sure. Thanks, Scott. Good to be back. So, Jay, you're in the hot seat to begin with here. Let's make sure we're all on the same page with regard to this regulatory agenda we were talking before. Uh, I don't think uh, a lot of people have this uh, <laughs> marked on their calendars for when this thing is released. Uh, for lack of a, a better phrase, I suppose, this is a blueprint kind of for the rulemaking process. Kind of explain to us what it's meant for and what, more importantly, we can learn from I, it. Uh, yeah, blueprint uh, inventory of all the uh, administrative actions and rulemakings that are either being planned have been proposed or finalized. And as you mentioned, it comes out uh, usually once in the spring, once in the fall. You never know exactly uh, when it'll be released, but uh, you can gather a great deal uh, of information um, throughout the, the various uh, departments across the executive branch. We certainly focus on the Department of Transportation's list, and it's kind of broken down by agency as well. So just kind of give you a sense of, of what's on the radar, what they're prioritizing, and, and some very, very projected and mm -hmm. estimated timelines that usually are, are sometimes tough to meet. And we did learn some things from this fall regulatory agenda. Let's start with the big issue here that we're all kind of keeping our eyes open for and expecting to, to kind of happen, I guess, I guess, any week now, speed limiters. Uh, the last piece of information we had about this proposed mandate was that we were supposed to hear something by, I think, December 29th was the date that they put out uh, a couple months ago, I guess it was. Now that date has been changed. It reads December 00, which at last check is not a valid date. Uh, what does that mean, Jay? What What is uh, this foretell, I suppose, for where we're headed? Maybe. You know, I think it's an indication that we're still in a holding pattern on the regulatory end and kind of the, the language that they used uh, in the latest update is, is kind of the same thing we saw in the back and forth in September. So no, ses no set speed. And, and we also heard from the FMCSA administrator uh, in Congress this week, and she was very clear that, that no notice of proposed rulemaking has been released. And mm -hmm. you know, multiple but, times she yeah. pointed that out when she was put on the hot seat. <laughs> well, and I had to answer that because of the confusion that we had, what, a couple months ago, mm -hmm. I guess it was, September. when they put 68 miles per hour out there and then quickly pulled that back and really gave no specific reason as to why. Right. So, so we're still kind of in what's going to happen land, I suppose. I think December 29th still remains the official date. Okay. I think if you kind of read some of the writing on the wall, that probably is going to be tough to see any official uh, proposed rulemaking uh, around that time. But we're, we're still kind of wait and see on what's going to be the next step uh, from the regulatory side and from FMCSA on speed limiters. Well, and correct me if I'm wrong here too, but there are a number of steps that have to be taken, I think, before they even get to that point too, right? And mm -hmm. that could be weeks Maybe months? I, I don't know. Yeah, kind of given the nature of this rulemaking, it's one that they've said that they're going to have to submit to the Office of Management and Budget for review. And uh, we have not seen them uh, complete that step. And, and generally, once they submit it to the Office of Management and Budget, you at least get a few weeks for them to turn that around before anything is formally uh, published in the Federal Register. So kind of do the math. We're, we're a couple of weeks away from, from December 29th, but there's still a lot of uh, uh, checks that they have to meet uh, before uh, the release. So I don't think I would put a lot of faith yeah. in them hitting that December 29th deadline because the previous attempt 
at speed limiter stalled out at OMB for like 13 months or something. Mm -hmm. Um, So, I mean, it's not uncommon to see a rulemaking spend two months to three months in there. I mean, we have seen them fly through, but given the controversy over this one and kind of the temperature surrounding it, I... I don't think it would behoove the agency to try and fast track this. Yeah, And we're certainly going to talk about the temperature that you kind of alluded to there a little bit later on here today. Uh, There is quite a bit of pushback in Congress that we're seeing now. Um, And we'll we'll get into that here. You mentioned the hearing, and that's where a lot of that came from. Let's kind of go through the issues here. Uh, We've been talking a lot about speed limiters in recent months. We have not been talking as much about another proposal that's out there, this plan for unique electronic identifiers on heavy trucks. Uh, First off, because we haven't been focused on it as much in recent months, a refresher, Jay, on just what we think this proposal might say. Right. So uh, last September of 2022, FMCSA uh, put out an advance notice of proposed rulemaking, the very initial stage of the rulemaking process, generally an information gathering attempt uh, that would consider requiring all commercial motor vehicles operating interstate commerce to to be equipped with a unique electronic identifier that would supposedly Mm -hmm. assist and improve the efficiency and effectiveness of roadside inspections. We've got a lot of concerns about how that would actually work, whether it would improve safety, how costly would it be, what would the privacy concern. So we, we responded to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking, but really raised some concerns uh, with the idea raise some concerns with Congress as well. And and in the latest regulatory agenda, that rulemaking has been moved to the long-term section, which means that the agency does not intend to make any movement on it for at least the next year. And if you go back to that 2016 uh, speed limiter proposal, that lingered uh, for years in the long-term action. So it kind of gives the sense that this is not uh, a rulemaking that the uh, agency is going to be looking to move and and actually publish a formal proposal anytime soon. So I think good news on that front, considering the problems that we have with this initial proposal. It didn't just kick the can down the road. They kind of punted it, I guess, is how we're looking at this one. Okay, so this is one thing we don't necessarily have to worry about or think about. Uh, for 2024, it sounds like maybe Hopefully around this not. time next year, but we'll keep an eye on that one. Uh, let's move down this list here because, again, there's a lot to cover. Um, one issue that has been in the spotlight quite a bit, and you've covered it quite a bit on Landline Magazine and Landline.media, Jamie, is this side underride proposed mandate for heavy trucks. We've had uh, advisory board meetings on this topic. The regulatory agenda gives us a hint, uh, another hint at FMCSA's plans, uh, and it looks like they will be moving forward here, uh, maybe. I see you kind of <laughs> kind of wincing and shaking your head there, Jay. Uh, yeah, th- uh, yes and no. A lot of this goes back to the 2021 uh, uh, Highway Bill, Bipartisan Infrastructure Law, which uh, tasked NHTSA with undergoing more side underride research and, if necessary, pursue a rulemaking process. We saw earlier this year that they've uh, completed that research. The cost-benefit, say, the cost-benefit analysis still indicates that uh, the cost of, of any mandate far exceeds any safety benefits. Uh, they put out some other, uh, I think, preliminary questions to, to gather some more information on how a potential mandate could be implemented, what are some of the operational concerns. At the same time, the 2021 bill uh, also established an advisory committee on underwrite protection. That committee has met a couple times, but is still expected to meet throughout the next year or so. So they've got uh, their the technical update uh, that we saw last week is that NHTSA is still in the analyzing comments portion of the review, looking at all the public comments that were submitted to the advance notice of proposed rulemaking that that was released earlier this year. We've also got the advisory committee still continuing to kind of discuss and debate the merits of of potential rulemaking. A lot of debate there. Yeah. Yeah. Bottom line is NHTSA not expected to undertake any advancement until at least of, uh, I believe it was a October of 2024. Next year, So, again, uh, this is one that's going to be in a holding pattern. I think in our opinion, when you talk to drivers, when you look at the safety research and the safety data that NHTSA has undertaken, 
we don't really see any reason to to kind of continue a rulemaking for a potential side underride mandate. But again, one will continue to follow over the next year or so. Yeah. We'll keep an eye on that. Uh, Another thing we're keeping an eye on, uh, automatic emergency braking systems and ADS, the automated driving system. Did I get that right? I think I did. You did. This is a huge concern uh, I know out there about what a mandate would look like for both of these things. We've talked about it before. Um, and 2024, Jamie, it's it's going to be – I think this is the year we're going to see some movement on these. Possibly, you know, and we've referenced the hearing a couple of times mm-hmm. that just happened earlier this week. It was really interesting to me to hear – while they, th- these agency heads would praise this technology in one breath, then we would turn around and we've got Tesla recalls. We have concern with – China getting infrastructure information mm-hmm. from LIDAR systems. Yep. You know, there's all of these many, many, many concerns. And yet the agency is, uh, FMCSA is still indicating that they are looking to take, go to the final rule stage in April of 2024 on yeah. the emergency braking. And that docket in particular, I mean, it, there was numerous comments in there for truck drivers, you know, telling their experiences where they had false alerts hit and stuff like that. That was even acknowledged in the hearing. Yeah. Well, like I said, we can get back to that. But yeah, we'll definitely it will be to interesting to see if the agency, with everything that's coming out, calling into question these automated systems, if the agency will go forward in April with the final rule, if we'll see them kick this can further down the road. And this process has moved really quickly, Jay. Yeah. And again, I'll, this again was uh, required in that 2021 highway bill, but also part of that legislation was uh, what we thought was a requirement to perform proper consultation with uh, professional drivers who have experience with the technology, have dealt with these false activations. And, you know, NHTSA and FMCSA, this was a, a joint proposal and it's a joint rulemaking. They said, uh, we don't need to meet with drivers before we put out the proposal. We'll hear, through them. We'll hear from them through the public comment period. The problem was the proposal kind of signified that they did not meet with any drivers and really kind of fell short of assuring some of the the safety things we want to see are comprehensively tested and that this technology works before any mandate goes into effect as soon as a, a few years down the line. So still so many concerns about the false activation alerts. We know NHTSA's actually conducting an investigation on that right now, which is still open. So why are we in such a hurry to move forward? (laughs) It really doesn't make any sense. um, With the rulemaking process at kind of the behest of safety, because they've been required by Congress to implement a mandate, but we've got to do it in a proper way to make sure that the technology works when that mandate goes into effect. And real quick, rushing this process, but not rushing the broker transparency (laughs) issue, which that is a can that keeps getting kicked down the road. And we're looking at, I think, October now for a notice of proposed rulemaking there, which is, I mean, quite frankly, it's disappointing. It's very disappointing, especially when we had assurances earlier this year from the agency that we would see something by summer, then early fall. Mm -hmm. And then in September, we found out that uh, through the same report that accidentally let the 68 miles per hour out of the bag on speed limiters, (laughs) that they kicked it to October. And we couldn't even get a straight answer then. But this report gives us final confirmation that they really have just pushed broker transparency down uh, you know, well over a year on this one. So that was, uh, oh, needless to say, OIDA was very disappointed. Uh, Todd's OIDA president, Todd Spencer, even called it the delay BS. So I'm, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, that's what it feels like, yeah. To say the least. And then, you know, but we are getting uh, possibly some relief on the broker and freight forwarder financial responsibility front in March, yeah. where we would see the bonds go up to 75000 and more enforcement along those lines. We'll keep an eye on that. You know what? We've got more to talk to. We talked about that hearing Let's extend this. If you two would stick around just for a little bit, uh, when we get the uh, on the other side of this break, we'll get into this hearing in the TNI committee where they covered a lot of ground. So stick around. We'll be right back right after this. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom, heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. That's why we're here. 
At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Are you familiar with Landline Magazine? You familiar with this? Representative, I am. It's very good magazine. Do you read it or do you just get it or it sits on your desk or do you read this? This uh, is the October 2023 issue, page 12. Very dangerous, very dangerous. It says here talking about the uh, speed limiters on this thing. Read this article because I tell you, the people that travel around and listen to the truckers, I think they would know better than the bureaucrats and specifically Congress. That was U.S. Representative Troy Nels of Texas giving Landline Magazine a shout out during a hearing within the House Transportation and Infrastructure Committee this week, asking FMCSA Administrator Robin Hutchison about speed limiters. Before we left you, we promised some coverage of that hearing. Jay Grimes of OIDA's Washington, D.C. office and Jamie Jones of Landline Magazine are still here to do just that. Jay, let's start with you here. This hearing really was a chance for committee members to directly ask questions of administrators within the DOT, and we had some interesting exchanges. Yeah, sort of uh, a checkup and part of the the transportation's uh, oversight role in the Department of Transportation. So we, I think they had uh, all the different uh, modal agencies uh, representative that fall under the jurisdiction of the Highways and Transit Subcommittee. So we had the Office of Secretary. We had Administrator uh, Hutchinson from FMCSA, the Federal Highway Administrator, the Federal Transit Administration Leader, uh, as well as uh, Acting Administrator from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. So kind of a, a comprehensive hearing on, on some items related to the implementation of the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law. But I think we also had some some trucking-specific uh, discussions on a number of the regulatory proposals uh, that are out there, uh, most notably speed limiters. Yeah, and we're going to spend some time talking about that here because there were a number of members of Congress who – we're not shy in letting their feelings know, <laughs> known about how they feel about speed limiters. Uh, and we had some very interesting questions and exchanges here. Um, I think the one that kind of stands out to me here is Representative Troy Nels of Texas, and we'll certainly talk about other members of Congress as well. But he was very direct. He gave a shout out to Landline Magazine, Jamie, and I know you were holding your head high about that one. Uh, but it was interesting to see the pushback here, and we had some interesting exchanges. Did we learn anything, I guess, is the, the main question. Yeah, I'll first also want to give a shout out to all the drivers out there who have contacted their members of Congress opposing the speed limiter uh, pro uh, proposal, um, letting their frustrations and concerns be heard. Because, uh, you know, we heard this from Mr. Nels, but there were five or, other, five or six other members of Congress that it sounded like they had just got off the phone uh, with a driver when they uh, were asking the administrator about speed limiters. And, and one thing we found out is that uh, FMCSA still has not proposed a, a, a formal uh, notice of proposed rulemaking in regards to speed limiters, still under review. They are aware of all the public comments uh, that have been submitted and um, are acknowledged that they are careful uh, to read through all of those. So, uh, but they did not really, you know, answer, I think, some of the con specific concerns that the members of Congress have, whether that's related to, uh, to slowing down the supply chain, um, drivers having to, to make up for lost time in construction zones, in rural areas, in And safety, in urban. safety concerns being yep. the big one. Mm -hmm. uh, and other productivity uh, concerns, taking away a driver's ability to, uh, to avoid a potential crash by taking uh, their ability to, to speed up um, in certain situations. So, yeah. uh, you know, it was, it was really, I think, uh, a worthwhile discussion for the members of Congress to have. You know, they, they mentioned, you know, the trucking industry is so overregulated. Why do we need another one? especially one that is not going to improve safety. And in many cases, it's going to have the opposite effect where it's going to cause more crashes um, when you're creating uh, these speed differentials among yeah. trucks and other vehicles. I was really impressed with the depth of knowledge that the question showed uh, from some lawmakers because there was one in particular that um, there's speed limiter research done by Stephen Johnson yeah. from the University of Arkansas from years ago. And it talks about how when you have big speed differentials, that increases the interaction 
interactions between cars and big trucks. Yep. And apparent, you know, one of the lawmakers just pinned down the FMCSA administrator and said, you're citing this research, but you're getting it wrong mm-hmm. in not so many words. And so I was really impressed that they, they've got that depth of knowledge now. And that is, just like Jay said, it's because drivers are pounding <laughs> this into their lawmakers' heads with repeated phone calls and emails and all of those things. So, And then I thought the other really good kind of striking point that was uh, made was a uh, lawmaker out of Illinois said, look, we had split speed limits in the state. We did the research. We know that having a different speed for trucks and a different speed for cars causes more crashes. We know this is the case. We have this research. And there's not a lot you can come back. You know, the agency didn't have much to come back on with, you know, come back at that with. Yeah. And that's kind of my question with all this, because it is encouraging to see, again, members of Congress speaking up about these issues and making sure that the administrators understand these issues and understand the potential problems they could cause. Uh, I guess what it kind of underscores is that, you know, FMCSA is going to do what FMCSA is going to do, whatever that may be. But it does sort of Maybe, maybe make me think that there is a legislative solution or at least legislative pushback that is going to hopefully maybe lead to something. Um, and I think that was really underscored in this hearing because we saw so much pushback about, uh, you know, speed limiters. Uh, what were the other issues that, that popped up during this hearing, too? There were a number of them. There was a lot of criticism AEB. about automated yeah. truck yeah. systems. We even heard about broker fraud. So, I mean, we heard about a lot of different trucking-related topics. Yeah. From OID's perspective, and I know you put in work all the time with these lawmakers to make sure they understand the association stance and the potential problems, again, with these various rulemakings. When you see something like this happen uh, in a hearing like this, I assume that gives you momentum to make further calls and sort of push this issue down the line even more. Yeah, no doubt. And you mentioned, uh, you know, potential legislative solutions. We've introduced that uh, with the DRIVE Act that would prevent FMCSA from from advancing any speed limiter uh, mandate. And we've, I think that was introduced uh, on the House in April of this year, a few months later over on the Senate side. And kind of every week, every couple of weeks, we continue to see uh, more lawmakers sign on uh, to that legislation. Uh, we also saw it in Included in the in the House Appropriations uh, Transportation Committee bill that unfortunately uh, you know, kind of is in the stall process on the House floor right now. But I think yes, there's a sign that once legis- you know, w- once lawmakers hear about this mandate, hear about the problems that it could cause, you know, they're signing on to the legislation that could prevent FMCSA um, from moving forward. And that's that's a big thing to remember on this speed limiter proposal. This is not something that's been mandated by Congress. This is something that FMCSA is acting uh, on their own uh, will on, which means that FMCSA, uh, that Congress can rein in FMCSA uh, given their oversight of the agency. And that's something we continue to make the case for lawmakers. So uh, get a chance, fightingfortruckers.com. And, <laughs> yeah. and I knew it was coming. That legislation. Yeah. And it's so easy to do that there. But the thing that I think that is so important about what Jay is saying is if Congress puts this roadblock up, if we get a legislative stop to the speed limiters, unringing that bell in a different Congress is going to be a big lift. Yeah. You know, it, it's this, you know, this back and forth. You don't have legislation move back and forth real fast. So if we can get this stop, that's why we need more co-sponsors. This could be the total death knell. Yeah, make it something that they can't ignore, right. I think, is is the big lesson here. And uh, fightingfortruckers.com, a great endorsement during this hearing because it did show, as you said earlier, the power of people reaching out to their mm-hmm. representatives and helping them understand the issue. Uh, I know we, we're on soapboxes all the time preaching, you know, you've you got to reach comment, out. You've got to reach out. You have to. You really do. Uh, and I know That's how Landline wound up in the lawmaker's <laughs> hands is a member sent it to Which him. Which you've blown up to poster size now, Jamie. <laughs> uh, Jay, Jamie, we could talk all day. Unfortunately, we're out of time. We appreciate it. We'll see you next time. Sounds thanks, good. Scott. Our thanks to you for listening to Landline Now today. We're back tomorrow with another show, and we hope to see you then. Until next time, take care and drive safe. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. 
I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And together we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com. <laughs> 